We've been going through the book of Daniel, Pastor Greg, this morning, a special message, but you will need, he's got his here, we, you're going to need a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we've got one for you. I need a Bible. I need a Bible. I need a, you will need one this morning. And with that, would you welcome our senior pastor, our teaching pastor, Pastor Greg Laurie. <laughs> My kids, cutting, but it's good. No, I was doing that. Hello, everybody. Aloha. Good to be back with you. <laughs> Last service, I was speaking, and I just started coughing, coughing. I thought, am I getting sick? And I realized it was the lay that I was wearing. I was having an allergic reaction. So then I gave it to Tommy. I said, here, and then Tommy unloaded it. Well, not unloaded it. He gave it to this nice lady here. So I hope you don't have an allergic reaction, but that lay and me, we're not working well together. Well, it's good to be back with all of you again. And uh, I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about marriage and family. Wow. But before I get started, let me take a poll. How many of you are married? Raise your hand. You're married. It's quite a few of you. Okay, how many of you are single? Raise your hand. Okay, good to see you. How many of you who are single would like to be married one day. Raise your hand up. Okay, keep your hand up. Keep it up. Now look around, look around. Look around. Because there's not a better place to meet somebody in, than in... Pair them up right now. We'll do like one of those weddings like Sun Young Moon used to do, right? Yeah, so best place to meet someone is in church. For sure. All right, now, how many of you who are married wish you were single again? Raise your hand. No, don't. <laughs> do not do it. So I think maybe I'm qualified to speak in this subject for three reasons. Yeah, three. Okay. Number one, my mother was married and divorced seven times. How does that possibly qualify me? She taught me what not to do. And honestly, I, I watched what happened to her, and I thought, I never want to end up that way. Number two, I've been married to my beautiful wife, Kathy, for 44 years, okay, so. <clears throat> I didn't say happily married, I said married. I said she was beautiful. No, it's been, we've been very happily married. She was here first service, but she's helping over in Sunday school right now, which makes it easier for me, because it's never easy to talk about marriage when your wife is looking at you. So this is gonna be a much better message than last service. Because A, I won't be coughing, and she's here? Oh no, where is she? There, she is here, there's Kathy back there in the back, wave to her. 44 years. She doesn't look 44 years old, much less having been married 44 years. However, I did marry her when she was 12. Um, I served prison time, but still, no, that's a joke. Visitors like, What's happening here? It's a joke. I was 21, she was 18. Now I have to behave myself and my message uh, because my wife is watching. And then lastly, being a pastor for quite a few years, uh, over 45, I've just about heard every story imaginable uh, as to why your marriage isn't working and why you can't make it and get through the problem you're in. And though the Bible does give allowance for divorce, and that's another subject for another time, let me just say this, and I think Ricky and Jim would agree with me, that most couples that I've seen who've gotten a divorce could have made it through if they applied the biblical principles. There are exceptions to that, but I'm telling you the vast majority could have survived and even had a flourishing marriage. So we need to revisit what God has to say. But you singles, don't tune me out. Chances are you'll be married, according to statistics, uh, statistics, not statistics. <laughs> yeah, so, and I have a few words for you as well, but before we start, why don't we pray together? Father, I pray for everybody here. Every one of us is loved by you. You have a plan for every one of our lives. 
I pray for every single person in this room that you will help them to be patient and to wait for that right man or woman you've chosen for them, a godly person, a person that will bring fulfillment to them and that they will bring to them, the other person. And now I pray, Lord, for all marriages, young marriages, marriages that have been around for quite a long time. I pray you'll bless everyone, strengthen every home in this congregation because we know the foundation of our country is built on the family. So Lord, bless each one, we pray, as we open your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, our text is Ephesians chapter five. So grab your Bible and turn there. The title of my message is Marriage 101. Heard about a husband and wife who were celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. Taking his wife by the hand, the husband made a dramatic announcement. He said, my dear wife, after, after 25 years of wedded bliss, I'm sending you to China. She said, China? I've always wanted to go to China. If you're going to do this for our 25th anniversary, what will you do for our 50th? The husband said, that's when I'll pick you up. <laughs> Not a good sign. That's why, that's why it's been said, uh, marriage is a three-ring circus. Engagement ring, wedding ring, and suffering. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. There's a movie out, uh, All the Money in the World, about the life of J. Paul Getty. Very wealthy man. And he was, was quoted to say, I would give my entire fortune for one happy marriage. Wow. One happy marriage. Is it even possible? One wonders, because the divorce stats are very high. Uh, the average divorce rate in America is around 50%, perhaps higher. However, that rises with the second marriage where it's at 60%, and then for a third marriage, it rises even higher to 73%. You know, we want that fairy tale story. You know, we envision meeting our guy or our girl on the beach as the sun is setting, running to us, in slow motion <laughs> with a song playing in the background. And we want it to be like we see it in the movies and we want to live happily ever after. The problem is that's a fairy tale. But I believe you can live happily even after. If you build your marriage on Christ and if you do what the Bible tells you to do. Let's just all agree on this. Culture today does not support marriage by and large. The media does not support it. Hollywood does not support it. So let's stop looking to celebrities who hook up and break up as a form of entertainment uh, for any kind of an example. Here's some celebrity weddings that didn't last very long. Kid Rock married Pamela Anderson, remember that? Their marriage lasted four months. Renee Zellweger and Kenny Chesney, their marriage, uh, marriage also lasted four months. Eddie Murphy married Tracy Edmonds. Their marriage lasted, wait for it, two weeks. Wow. Carmen Electra married Dennis Rodman. That marriage lasted six days. <laughs> Sinead O'Connor entered her fourth marriage after 16 days. Wow. Maybe you've heard of uh, actor uh, Tatum or Channing Tatum and his wife, uh, Jenna Dwan Tatum. They divorced after nine years of marriage. And in a public statement, together they said, they're lovingly choosing to separate. Lovingly choosing to separate. Remember when Gwyneth Paltrow uh, divorced her husband, Chris Martin, of Coldplay? And she described it as a conscious uncoupling. Hmm. Conscious uncoupling. Lovingly choosing to separate. How about consciously choosing to lovingly stay together? Yes, amen. That's God's way, and it can be done. But a lot of people are cynical about marriage today. There was a famous actress that recently got divorced, and she was quoted to say, I don't want to sound bitter because I'm definitely not, but I don't know if people are meant to be together forever. And a 2014 study of millennials found that 43% of them would support what is called a beta marriage model. A beta marriage model. And that is basically where you test the relationship before two years before you decide to commit or dissolve it. 
And 36% of millennials supported the real estate marriage model in which couples would commit to a set period of time ranging from five to 30 years and at the end renegotiate and decide if they want to remain married. I'm gonna save you a lot of trouble. The real estate model is not gonna work, nor is the beta model. Oh, why, because the Bible says so? Well, yes, as a matter of fact. But statistics bear this out as well, or as I said recently, statistics. <laughs> it's been revealed that couples that live together have a far higher divorce rate, and in fact, couples who live together gamble and lose in 85% of the cases. So if you want to sabotage a potential marriage, live together. Why is that a problem? Because right out of the get-go, you're building it on the wrong foundation in disobedience to God. See, here's what you need to do. Take your time before you get married. My wife and I, we divorced three times. We courted, if you will, for three years. We broke up three times. It was like an annual event, the big breakup. And it was one of those breakups where it's like, I never want to see you again. And then we would get back together. We got it out of our system ahead of time, and then we were married, you see. That's why you want to take your time before you're married. As old Benjamin Franklin once said, and he said this to me personally. He was a great guy, by the way. Very creative. Anyway, he said to me, no, he didn't say this to me. He said, keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half shut afterwards. The problem is we have our eyes half shut before we get married, and then they're open. Never marry a man or a woman that you're gonna change. I love them, but I'm gonna change them. Hold on, they probably are not gonna change. They might even get worse. They'll probably become an exaggerated version of what they are now. So don't go into a marriage to fix someone or to change someone. You need to take your time and look for a godly person if you're a single person. Say, who should I marry? Start with a Christian. And here's the thing. People will say they're a Christian if it is in their interest to say so. You know, you might be an attractive girl. And by the way, a Christian girl is doubly attractive to a non-believing guy. Here's why. Number one, she's probably a beautiful girl, attractive girl. But then number two, she has that inner beauty that girls that are not believers just don't have. It's called virtue, and it's in short supply in this culture. So a guy sees you, he's like, whoa, that's the kind of girl I'd like to maybe marry, you know? He walks up, he asks you out, and you say, well, hold on, are you a Christian? He says, well, why do you ask? You say, well, because I would never even go out with a non-Christian. Oh, well, hallelujah. <laughs> even, the, even the way he says it's kind of sleazy, you know? Because I'll talk to girls, I'll talk to guys. Are you going out with a Christian? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a, how do you know? He says God all the time. Really? <laughs> Look for a man of God. Look for a woman of God. Let me take it a step further. Look for someone even more godly and Christ-like than you are. Why? Because the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked together with non-believers for what fellowship does light have with darkness or righteousness with unrighteousness? Listen to this. For every case you could give me of a non-believer who was won over to Christ uh, by the believer after they got married, I could give you a hundred stories of a believer who was drugged down. See, I could point to someone in this room to demonstrate and I could say, see, see if you can pull me off this platform. Now, I might be stronger than the person I would choose. And I might have more physical strength than they have. And I do have more strength than anyone in this room. But um, <laughs> in my mind. But not in reality. But anyway, I can say, I'll pull you up. And I'd use all of my strength and pull. But you might be able to pull me off the platform much easier because you have gravity on your side, you see. So that's the way it is in a relationship with a non-believer. In effect, they have gravity on their side. They can pull you down far more easily than you can pull them up. So look for a godly person. Don't look for a person that just professes to be a Christian, but is a true follower of Jesus Christ. Because once you're married, you want to have a marriage that will last for a lifetime. We need to strike the word divorce from our vocabularies. Applaud for that right now, please. Come on now. 
Don't get all quiet on me. Even you who have been divorced know how hard that is and how painful that is. If you're going into it with the option, well, you know, I always have a release clause, I'll divorce them. No, no, no. If, you, if that's the way you think, stay single. Do us all a favor. Do your kids a favor. But go in there and do everything you can to make that marriage a success. As I said, there's exceptions to that. It's another message for another time. But listen to this. Wedlock should be a padlock. And we need to honor those vows and do everything we can to strengthen that marriage. Oh, but Greg, you don't understand. Our situation is different. Really? Trust me, I've heard a lot of stories. If I told you all the things, uh, Ricky and I and Linda and Kathy were talking about crazy things we've seen and heard being in ministry all these years. I can't even tell you some of these things that are so insane. But I've heard most of the things out there. But one I often hear is, well, we have irreconcilable differences. Irreconcilable differences. I have a two-word response. Ready for it? Shut up. <laughs> what are you talking about? Irre Everybody has irreconcilable differences. I've had irreconcilable differences with my wife for 44 years. <laughs> She's neat and I'm messy. She's sometimes late. I'm usually early. She likes to watch British programs on TV. And I like shoot 'em ups She's cute and I'm fat. It's irreconcilable. <laughs> the funny thing is before you're married, you're often attracted to someone different than you. There's truth to the statement, opposites attract, right. Right? right? But now all of a sudden, the very thing that attracted you has become a, quote, irreconcilable difference, end quote, and there's no way that you can resolve that. That's nonsense. You have to hang in there. Oh, but it's their fault. It's their fault. When someone comes to me and says, it's totally the fault of this husband or totally the fault of this wife, I already know where the fault is. It's with you. It starts with you. It starts with me. We need to stop reading each other's mail. What does that mean? Don't quote to your wife the verses that pertain to what she should be doing. Don't quote to your husband the verses that pertain to what he should be doing. Read your own mail and do what you're supposed to do and things will start improving quickly. Start with you. And so God gives us a solution to all of these things. And let me just say, if you're single... It can be a good thing. It's not better to be married. It's different to be married. And sometimes God calls people to be single for their whole life. And he can use them in a powerful way. The Bible's filled with stories of people who were single. The Apostle Paul was basically single in life. Uh, Jesus was single, clearly. Um, so many other characters we could point to, modern folks who have been used by the Lord. So that's a special calling. But having said that, when you're single, you're, you're, you're mobile. You can do things a married person cannot do. In fact, Paul writes to married people in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, an unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work, thinking how to please him, but a married man can't do that so well. He has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. That's not a criticism. That's an acknowledgement of the fact that when you're married, you, you have to care for your wife. And when you have children, you care for your children. You have responsibilities. A single person. They can be open to options. Move here, go there, go in the mission field, try this other thing. There's a lot of mobility there. The main thing is find contentment where you are now, not in a relationship or lack thereof, but in your relationship with God. Paul said, I have found whatever state I'm in there and to be content. The idea being, if you're single, be content in the Lord. If you're married, be content. It starts there. But then we want to do our part when the Lord brings us to that right person. You know, it's amazing to me how some people will obsess about weddings and forget about their marriages. They give more thought to purchasing a house than building a home. And those are the things that matter. i tell you what, we had the cheapest wedding of all time. The, the ring that I originally got my wife, I paid $130 for. And I was impoverished. I was an impoverished preacher just starting out. Uh, there was not a lot of promise when Kathy met me. She couldn't see that underneath all of that hair, I had long hair down to here and a beard, she couldn't see that underneath that was a bald man. And... Um, <laughs> 
she had no promise of a comfortable life. She had no hope for anything other than this guy named Greg says he loves me and wants to marry me and she did love me and I loved her and, and our wedding was so budget. It, there was nothing, I mean, I know people who've had weddings, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on their beautiful, the greatest cake, cake and then there's nothing to follow. It falls apart. We get all obsessed with all the beautiful wedding. Think more about the marriage. Oh, but our home, our home, or I should say, our house, our house. Fine, think about your home. It might be an apartment. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's about building that strong unit, that marriage built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Okay, how do you do that? Ephesians chapter th uh, 5, verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let me just stop there for a moment and identify two things we need to be doing. Husbands are told to love their wives. Wives are told to respect their husbands. That's not to say wives should not love their husbands and husbands should not respect their wives, but it is to say Paul was very specific in his verbiage. Husbands, love your wife. Wife, respect your husband. Listen to this. Women need love and men need respect. That's not to say that men don't need love and women don't need respect, as I said, but it's specific and I think we should pay attention to that. Husbands, you need to love your wife. How? As Christ loves the church. Oh man, is that a tall order? That's a tall order. We'll spend a lifetime pursuing that and we'll fall short time and time again. But how did Christ love the church? He laid his life down for us. He served us. And that's how we are to be in the marriage. Listen, the husband should be the spiritual leader in the home. But in so many Christian homes today, the husband is passive at best and counterproductive at worst. He's the one who drags his feet when it's time to go to church. Have that happened today in your home? Honey, let's go to church. I'm in Hawaii. I've worked all week long, two jobs. I don't want to go to church. Or we're vacationing in Hawaii. And I, really? You should have had the idea, guy. You should be the leader. You should be the one that, say, that says, let's, let's pray for our meal. Hey, kids, let's open up the Bible. Let me share a couple thoughts with you here. Hey, let's do this. Let's do that. You should be the leader. So often it's a woman who's a leader. And God bless you ladies. Because if you didn't lead, it'd be a mess. Husbands, it's time to rise to the challenge. Love her as Christ loves the church. You need to affirm her. You need to physically tell her you love her. Yes, that's right. Verbalize it. When's the last time you told your wife you love her? Those words, I love you. Let's correct that right now. Guys, you ready? Ready. ready for an awkward moment? <laughs> okay, men, husbands, take the hold, of your wife, the hold of your wife. Take the hand of your wife. I don't know what the hold is. Don't do that. Take the hand of your wife. I'm glad to see that Jim is his wife Tamara here with him this time. First service, he was all alone, and he held hands with a water bottle. And he said his wife came to the second service, and here she is. Take the hand of your wife. Husbands, turn to your wife and just repeat these words after me. Greg is an amazing preacher. No, seriously, just say that. Greg is an, just say that. Greg is, no, don't, don't say that. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's get serious. Take the hand of your wife, turn to her, say this to her. I hate it when preachers make us do stuff like this. I hate it. Hey, no. Okay, seriously. Turn to your wife, say this. I love you. Let's hear it. Very sweet. Was that so hard? Women's need love. Women need love. And women's too. How about girls? Hold on, because I know the girls are going, get them, Greg, get them, kick them, kick them. Ah, now it's a girl's turn. Ladies, listen to me. Men need respect. Yeah, they need love. They need respect. Guys are really not all that complex. They really aren't. Which is, with a guy, what you see is what you get. We'll tell you. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I would like sex, please. Oh, 
If you're young and you don't know what that means, ask your parents later. Okay, sorry. <laughs> girls are mysterious. Girls don't even understand girls. It's true, they don't. Sometimes a girl will say or do something. I'll say, I have no idea what she's doing. My wife says, I don't either. <laughs> respect your man. When's the last time you told him, I respect you. And I thank you for all that you do for me every single day. You're a great spiritual leader. You're a good provider. You're a great protector. You're a great dad. I love you. I respect you. Never denigrate your man in front of other people. You know, you're out with another couple having dinner. Oh, my husband, he's such a loser. He's lazy. You know, stop that. Stop. What if it's true? It's still, stop that. You know, often, ladies, let's be honest, you're, you're quick to tell your husband what he isn't doing right. When's the last time you affirmed him for what he did right? You're quick to say, you don't do this. You take the trash out. You're messy. You did, yeah, okay, okay. Work with him on that. He needs to hear that. But also when he does it right, and thank you for doing that. I love you. I respect you. Very important. If we would just start, I could stop the message. Just go home and do that this week. I'm telling you, it could transform your marriage. Right. Just start there. But there's more. Wait, there's more. Like they see in the commercials, right? Two operative words that Paul uses here for marriage. These are foundational things. It's marriage 101. The words are leave and cleave. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. Leave and cleave. Start with leave. Basically, what God is saying is when you are married, you must make a change in other relationships. The closest relationship outside of marriage is specified here, that of a son to his parents, meaning that if it's necessary to leave your father and mother, then certainly all lesser ties must be broken, changed, or left behind. Let me say that again. If it's necessary to leave father and mother, then certainly all other relationships or lesser ties must be broken, changed, or left behind. Okay, so you're still a child to your parents when you get married. You're still a sibling to your brothers and sisters, but now you're a wife or you're a husband. And now your primary responsibility is to your spouse. And some people don't make this break. You know, the parents are still kind of running their lives. I heard about a guy who wanted so much to please his mother. And he wanted to get married too, though. So he found a girl he thought was very attractive and took her home to meet his mom. His mom didn't like her. So he went out and found another girl he thought was a good prospect for marriage, brought her home, introduced her to his mother. His mother didn't like her either. Then he went and found a girl that looked like his mother, talked like his mother, dressed like his mother. But the problem is his father didn't like her. So... <laughs> Did you know that was coming? <laughs> but here's really the thing we need to remember. Marriage is about partnership. It's someone you walk through life with now. And your spouse should be your best friend. Let me say that again. Your spouse should be your best friend. Well, I love my wife, but I got my buddy, my best buddy. Well, maybe that was fine before, and you can have your buddies, but your wife should be your best buddy. Yes, that's right. She should be your closest confidant. She should be the one that you love above all others and communicate with. Uh, I think one of the reasons that people who are married uh, are better off emotionally and even physically, according to studies, is because they have someone to do life with. And marriage is sort of like a shock absorber. So when something hard comes, you talk to your wife or your husband. When something wonderful happens, you share the joys with your spouse. But when you're all alone, it's challenging and it's hard. But the point is, make your spouse your number one friend. And I think this is one of the problems, is that doesn't happen. And we let other friendships in. And so it's interesting because there's a passage, 1 Peter 3, it says, Husbands, dwell with your wives according to understanding, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, so your prayers are not hindered. See, if your marriage is not right, it can hinder your prayer life. So maybe you've been praying lately and it seems like your prayers don't go any higher than the ceiling. Oh, well, did you have a fight with your wife that you never resolved? 
Well, yes, but she was wrong and I was right. Yeah. Well, maybe your prayers are being hindered because you haven't dealt with that. And so this is something we need to do. And actually that phrase dwell means to dwell down with or to give maintenance to. Give maintenance to. You give maintenance to your car, or at least I hope you do. <laughs> I'm not a mechanical guy. I wish I was. I admire people that can pop open the hood of a car and get their tools out and fix it. I just stand there in amazement. I wait for the idiolites to go on. Oh, change oil. <laughs> oh, time to get gas. Oh, time to get a service. Uh, you know, but you have to give maintenance to your car. If you see a beautiful car cruising down the road, maybe an old classic like a 57 Chevy or a 1967 Fastback Mustang, like I have, um, and you say, well, look at that thing. It looks like it just drove off the showroom floor. Well, that's because someone has lovingly maintained that car and kept it in running order and, and washed it and waxed it and preserved it. And when you see a marriage cruising down the road of life that's lasted 30, 40, 50 years, that didn't happen by accident. That's because they gave attention to their marriage. The moment you stop giving attention to your marriage is when problems are going to begin. The same can be said of your relationship with God. The moment I cut back on Bible study and I cut back on church attendance and I'm not praying like I used to, you're going to go into spiritual decline. And in the same way, the time you start cutting back on, well, just doing romantic things with your spouse, giving attention to your marriage, caring about your marriage. Oh, we've been married. We'll hang in there no matter. Don't be so sure. Strengthen that foundation. It's like a garden. A garden needs to be weeded. Flowers need to be watered. You need to give your attention to it. And marriage is the same way. Give your attention to it. And that's why Peter is saying, be aligned with your wife. Give maintenance to this relationship. But then you leave and then you cleave. Leave other relationships and cleave into your wife. By the way, that word cleave is an interesting word. It means to adhere to, to stick or to be attached by some strong tie. The verb suggests a determined action. So it's not like you're stuck together. It's like you're holding on to each other. There's a difference, right? If I'm climbing up at the face of a mountain, I'm hanging on for dear life. Why? Because I don't want to die. So in marriage, it's not like, all right, we're stuck, he's gone. No, it's like, oh man, I want you close to me. I want you with me. And this is something that's important. It's actually a word that uh, implies being cemented together. Have you ever used super glue? Super glue is so weird. Because it, it's liquid like and it almost seems like it doesn't work. So you put it on. Is this really working? And then it works. Yeah. I know because one time I got some super glue on my finger and on my thumb. And they were stuck together. <laughs> so it's like a lot of okay. Hey, Greg, how you doing? Uh, okay. I just hope I can get them apart someday because I don't like this. So it's adhering to one another. And this involves constant communication. Look, there are two times when a man doesn't understand a woman. Two times, before marriage and after marriage. But uh, <laughs> apart from that, it's good. No, seriously. You want to know the number one reason marriages fail? A study was done among those who got divorced. They were asked to give the reason their marriage failed. You guys that were here for the first service, don't answer. Let's give the other folks a try. Who knows why most marriages fall apart? Who can guess? Go. What'd you say? What? Very good. Exactly right. Were you here for a service? You're smart. Is that your husband next to you? You have a smart wife, sir. Tell her you love her. Tell her. You're not saying it. I don't see your lips on me. Say, I love you. Did he say it? Did he say, I love you? We need to work on the communication here. <laughs> work on that. It's good, though. She's right. Poor communication. 86% said deficient communication. You need to learn how to disagree. I've had couples come in and they say, we want to get married. Will you marry us? And I'll say, well, Tell me a little bit about yourselves. When did you meet? Uh, what's your background? How long have you been Christians? And then I'll ask them, have you had an argument yet? Oh, no. We love each other so much. We've never argued. Get out of my office. <laughs> you serious? Go have an argument. 
You have to learn how to resolve conflict. You have to learn how to disagree and, and not let it escalate to screaming and yelling and never to hitting, God forbid. But learn how to resolve these things and some people never do so. Ruth Graham once said, quote, a good marriage consists of two good forgivers. And that also includes physical affection. Heard about a couple that were having troubles and so they went to see the pastor. They didn't know what was wrong with their marriage and the pastor listened for a while after asking a lot of questions. He said, I think I know what the main problem is. He stood up from behind his desk, walked around to the front where the lady was. He said, ma'am, would you stand up? And he gave her a hug. And he turned to the husband and he says, that's what your wife needs. She needs a hug every single day. The husband said, well, okay, what time do you want me to bring her back tomorrow? No. <laughs> You're supposed to hug her. <laughs> You're supposed to love her. You're supposed to kiss her. And communicate. And give attention to your marriage. Otherwise, problems will begin to develop. Yes, there are those challenges. Every marriage goes through tests. Ours has gone through tests. Yours will go through tests. But if it's built on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, it will actually get stronger with the passing of time. A study was done in couples who were having conflict but chose to stay married. Two-thirds of unhappily married spouses who stayed married reported their marriages were happy five years later. And then more striking, long-term studies demonstrated that two-thirds of those unhappy marriages out there will become happy within five years if people stay married and do not get divorced. I had someone ask me recently, should we stay together for the sake of the kids? Sure. What? Oh yeah. What if we don't love each other? What is love? Is it an emotion? Or is it a commitment that you're going to continue to honor? I don't think you should only stay together for the sake of the kids, but to be honest, it's not a bad reason. You can take most of the social ills in America today and trace them directly to the breakdown of the family, to divorce, and specifically to the absence of fathers. I'm telling you everything. Girls getting pregnant out of wedlock, broken home. Guys ended up incarcerated, broken home. Kids joining gangs, broken home. People getting on drugs, broken home. I'm telling you, it's almost always the case. I read an interesting couple of articles the other day about sex trafficking. And I think we often think sex trafficking is just people brought from the outside of our country in, uh, into America and they're taken advantage of. And that certainly happens. But I was shocked reading this article how many of these were just young American girls in particular. And what happens is um, there's predators out there, right? So parents, pay attention to your kids' social media. By the way, a little extra, no extra charge for this. Uh, I don't think a child has a right to privacy when they live under my roof. Amen. Sorry, kids. Amen. I feel you hating me right now, but you don't. I think you can check their phones, you can check their computers, you can check their rooms, and you know, because they need your help. And one day they'll grow up and do the same thing, so don't worry about it. But the thing is, is that there are predators out there, and they follow young girls in particular on social media. Girls that like to post selfies, and They'll look at these girls and sometimes maybe the young lady will say, well, I'm lonely or I'm having troubles at home. And then they'll pounce. They'll make contact with the person. Then some of these girls will meet these predators. They'll go out. They'll get the girl drunk. They'll have sex with her and they'll take pictures of her. And then they will blackmail the child with the pictures and say, if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm gonna send these photos to your parents and I'm gonna put them on the internet where people will see them all around the world. And this is actually a strategy they use that works. And you know what else I found reading this article? Every one of those girls, they gave the profiles of like 10 girls that this had happened to, 10 girls from American homes that this happened to. Every one of those homes was a broken home. Should we stay together for the sake of the kids? Sure, why not? That's a good place to start. But better stay together for the sake of the Lord, for the sake of our testimony, for the sake of our country. 
Our country is built on the family. You know, a family can survive without a nation, but a nation cannot survive without the family. So it's so important on so many levels. But I'm saying just hang in there. Get through those hard times. And I think I can promise you the best is yet to come. Okay, let me close now. And just say a word to everybody here, regardless of if you're married or single. The answer is Jesus. The answer is not marriage per se. The answer is not singleness per se. The answer is not success. The answer is not religion The answer is Jesus. You say, okay, that's the answer. What's the question? The question is, what is the meaning of my life? Why am I here in this earth? Why do I exist? And what happens after I die? Here are the answers. You're put on this earth to know God. The meaning of your life is to have a relationship with God and to walk in his will. What happens after you die? That's entirely up to you. According to the Bible, there are two options. Heaven and hell. Oh, we don't like hell. Well, it's still there. <laughs> heaven is, hell is just as real as heaven. Hell is just as eternal as heaven. And the last thing that God wants is to send anyone to hell. And in fact, if you end up in hell, you'll have no one to blame in that final day but yourself. Because Jesus has done everything possible to keep you out of hell, starting with dying on the cross for our sins and paying the price of the wrongs that we've done and willing to forgive us no matter what we've done. And I ask you today in closing, is Christ living in you? You say, well, what does that even mean? Is Christ living in me? What I'm saying is when you become a Christian, it's about a relationship. It's not just about going to a church or believing certain things, though there's value in that. But when it's all said and done, it's about Jesus himself coming and taking residence in your heart. And my question to you is, is Jesus living in your heart and life right now? You might say, well, I don't really know. Well, I think if he's there, you'll know. If someone moved into your house last night while you were sleeping, (laughs) you came home, or you got up in the morning and they're like cooking fish, you know, in the kitchen. I think you'd notice, right? I'm not suggesting Jesus is gonna come in and cook fish or something. My point is, If someone came into your home, you would know. If the creator of the universe, the almighty God, has taken residence in your heart, you'll know. And if you don't know, maybe he hasn't yet. The Bible says, for as many as received him, he gave them the power to become sons of God. So being a Christian is receiving Christ himself. It's asking him to come and be your savior and Lord. And I would like to give you an opportunity to do that as we close now in prayer. Jesus says he stands at the door of your life and he knocks. And if you hear his voice and open the door, he will come in. Listen to this. He's just a prayer away. He's just a prayer away. And we're going to close now in prayer. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to say, Jesus, come into my life. You might be married. You might be single. You might be young. You might be old. You might be a guy. You might be a girl. doesn't matter. Everybody needs Jesus. And he's ready to forgive you and give you a fresh start in life. So if you need that fresh start, if you want your sin forgiven, if you want to be sure that you'll go to heaven when you die, respond to this invitation as we pray together, okay? Let's all bow our heads, if you would. Everybody praying. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and laying your life down and then rising again from the dead. Now, Lord, I pray for any here that do not know you. Help them to see their need for you. Help them to come to you. Help them to believe in you today. We would ask in your name. Now, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, how many of you would say today, Greg, I need Jesus Christ. I want him to forgive me of my sin. I want to know that when I die, I will go to heaven I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. Pray for me now. Listen, if you want your sin forgiven, if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want to know that you will go to heaven when you die, if you want to say yes to Jesus Christ and believe in him today, would you lift your hand up and let me pray for you? Lift your hand up high where I can see it and I'll pray for you today. God bless you and you and you and you. God bless you, sir. Anybody else? Raise your hand up back there in the corner. God bless you. 
In the very, very back there, God bless you and you, two young ladies back there. Anybody else? You want Christ to come into your life. You want to know you'll go to heaven when you die. Raise your hand up. Let me pray for you today. God bless you. You may never have another moment like this again. Let me pray for you. You might need to take this step. Raise your hand up. I'll pray for you now. God bless you back there. Yes, God bless. God bless you. Well, our heads are still bowed. Maybe some of you would say, you know what? I've messed up in life. I know it's right. I've disobeyed God. I've made bad decisions. I've done stupid things. I reap the consequences of them. But I want to get right with God. I want to turn from that sin and have a second chance as a follower of Jesus. I need to come back to the Lord. Would you pray for me today? If that's your desire, if you want to make a recommitment to Christ, would you raise your hand up right now and let me pray for you. God bless you. God bless you and you. Anybody else? God bless you. Amen. God bless you back there in the front row, young men there. God bless you guys. I'll wait one, God bless that little boy there. God bless you. I see you, buddy. I'll wait one more moment. If you haven't raised your hand yet, lift it now. Let me pray for you. You want to make the commitment, a recommitment to Christ. God bless the lady right there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless all of you. And now I want every one of you that has raised your hand, I want you to stand to your feet and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. I want you to stand up right now. Every one of you that raised your hand saying you want Christ in your life, stand up and we're gonna pray together and we're gonna get this resolved. Stand to your feet, stand up, stand up. Go on, stand up. God bless you. Stand up. Don't be embarrassed. Stand up. You're among, you're among family and friends here today, okay? So this is the place to do it. Anybody else? There might be someone else that wants to stand up and make this commitment, a recommitment of Christ. Maybe you didn't raise your hand during that prayer. It's okay. Just say, yeah, I want to do that. Stand to your feet. We're going to pray. Why would you not want to do this? Anybody else? Stand now. All right. All of you standing, I want you to pray this prayer out loud right where you stand. I'll lead you in a prayer I want you to pray it out loud after me. All right, let's all pray. Pray these words out loud, you guys, that are standing. Pray this, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I choose to follow you from this moment forward as Savior and Lord as God and friend. Thank you for calling me and accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless all of you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you guys. Are we going to... So I think what we're going to do, uh, Jim, are we going to take the Bibles to them? Did, did you get your Bibles already? Awesome. Well done, you guys. Okay. So hopefully, did all of you who pray with me get one of these? Just say yes, not if you did. Did you got one? Okay, good. You guys get this? Okay, what is this that we're giving you? This is called a start Bible. This is the New Testament with some notes that I wrote that are really designed for someone new in the faith or someone recommitting their life to Christ. So start reading through this start Bible. This is a great church for you to attend, of course. And we're here every Sunday and midweek opportunities. And if you're from the mainland or some other place, uh, we'll make a recommendation for a good church for you to get plugged into. But God bless all of you. And uh, why don't we all stand up right now and Pastor Ricky's gonna come with some closing words.